Wages in Australia are stagnant and the unions are on the march. They lament the fact that work is becoming more and more casualised and it's harder to find and keep full-time work. They demand we hashtag change the rules, presumably to something that will favour the workers and totally not the unions, I swear. The thing is, we already did that. In 2009, then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd completely changed industrial relations in order to favour the worker, or so the Labour Party claimed. They tore up the Workplace Relations Act of 1996 and replaced it with the Fair Work Act of 2009. This was the big reform of the unions. It was supposed to make things fairer. So what happened? Well, unions got what they wanted. Then, when it all went wrong, they typically blamed everyone else. Oh, and there's one other thing keeping your wages down. See if you can guess what it is. Economics is a fascinating field. It's the study of human behaviour in an economic setting. What makes us do what we do? Why do we buy what we buy? Economic laws govern our lives every single day. The problem is, people often get confused because economic laws are mostly general. Even Say's law that describes the basics of all economic activity is the law of markets. It's not a hard science, but there are certainly economic laws all markets always follow. One of those laws is supply and demand. The basics are as follows. If you increase supply, prices go down. If you decrease supply, prices go up. Increase demand, prices go up. Decrease demand, prices go down. Another way of looking at it is on a supply and demand curve graph. In this, as prices go up, demand drops. As prices go down, demand increases. And the opposite is true for supply. The supply and demand curves both sit on the same axes and where they intersect is known as the market equilibrium. Remember, this is a generalization. In reality, prices are fluctuating all the time, but they always want to find some equilibrium and will move towards it. A great example of this law in action can be seen in a rideshare system like Uber. As drivers flood the market, each will make less money, but as demand surges, prices automatically increase to compensate. Few examples are as clear as this, but this shows exactly how all markets operate. All commodities are subject to the law of supply and demand, and there are no exceptions. Fruit, oil, professional services, and even wage labor. Everything bought and sold in a market is subject to the law of supply and demand. The problem is, Many people have big incentives to lie and tell you wages are somehow outside this law. Communists tell workers their wages are being stolen by the employer because it fits their narrative and builds political capital. Unions tell workers the same thing because it means more union dues as well as more power. It's a lie and will always be a lie. Wages are subject to the same laws of economics as all other commodities. This is the reason wages are stagnant and permanent jobs are slowly dying in Australia. There's also the issue of high taxes, but I've already made a video on this, so you can go check it out after you watch this one. Link in the description. Industrial relations law in Australia represents a serious drag on demand for workers. It's very difficult to fire people, thus hiring becomes a big risk. Then, when you do hire, the government dictates the wages that you must pay them. You cannot pay below the minimum, and if they work during certain hours of the week, then they must get multiples of their base wage. All employees receive a mandatory bare minimum of conditions no matter where they are hired, and many are under something called an award. Awards dictate to a business exactly what benefits and pay an employee is entitled to. Therefore, the business must pay them or suffer the consequences. It's convoluted, inflexible, and acts as little more than a price floor above market equilibrium. Looking at supply and demand, the result of this is simple, an oversupply of workers and an undersupply of jobs. This is exactly the situation we have right now. 
Hiring is needlessly risky for employers. It means either jobs become casual, as in there's no set hours and you can be fired at any time, or they aren't offered at all. We can see this in the underemployment rate that's risen significantly since 2008, but this doesn't fully highlight the issue. When you break it down by age, it becomes obvious. Youth underemployment has soared since the regulations were changed. Australia's industrial relations system is horrible for anyone trying to find a job, especially if they are new to the workforce. These employees are generally the biggest risk for employers, so they are the last ones to get jobs. All this wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the second major problem, the big one. Did you guess what it is? That's right, mass immigration. Australia has always had a relatively high immigration rate, but since 2007, it's really skyrocketed. Rather than talk about who's to blame, hint, it was the same bunch of fools who changed the industrial relation laws, I'm going to talk about the effect it's had. In 2013, George Borges published research for the Center of Immigration Studies in the United States. In that, he found, the best empirical research that tries to examine what has actually happened in the US labor markets aligns well with economic theory. An increase in the number of workers leads to lower wages. Another US study found wages of highly skilled workers were essentially unaffected, but low skilled workers saw big decreases. This is what you'd expect if you flood the nation with low-skilled migrants as the US has. The opposite has occurred in Britain after Brexit and a subsequent drop in immigration. Businesses across Britain are short of workers across scores of sectors and at all skill levels, putting pressure on bosses to hike salaries recruiters are warning. Companies are reluctant to raise pay when productivity has been stagnant, but have found themselves with no choice as staff from minimum wage entrance through the professionals and all the way to leadership positions are so scarce. Bloomberg reflects the findings. UK wages pick up as fewer Eastern EU workers fill jobs. UK pay is picking up after employment among citizens of the Eastern countries that joined the European Union more than a decade ago fell for the first time since 2009. Average weekly earnings, excluding bonuses, rose 2.5% in the fourth quarter from a year earlier, the most since December 2016, the Office for National Statistics said on Wednesday. The overall employment rate rose to 75.2%, close to a record, though unemployment increased to 4.4% as fewer workers were economically inactive. They've even provided a lovely little table to highlight the situation. As you can see, the share of new jobs going to foreign workers has dropped significantly, and British workers got a pay rise as a direct result. Back in Australia, wage growth has all but stagnated since 2008, and is now at or below inflation. Do you notice how the drop in wage growth matches the huge increase in immigration? Unconventional economist Leith Van Onselen has an excellent article on the Macro Business website. I'm not sure if he's related to Peter, gender quotas are about merit and I'm totally not a leftist, Van Onselen, I hope not for Leith's sake. Either way, the article is well worth a read, so I'll link in the description. He notes wages are stagnant despite increases in labour productivity and analyses a report by the Productivity Commission. Here is the most important quote from the report. The increase in labour supply causes the labour capita ratio to rise and the terms of trade to fall. This generates a negative deviation in the average real wage. By 2025, the deviation in the real wage is minus 1.7%. Broadly, incumbent workers lose from the policy, while incumbent capital owners gain. At a 5% discount rate, the net present value of per capita incumbent wage income losses over the period 2005-2025 to 2025 is $1,775. The net present value per capita incumbent capital income gains is $1,953 per capita. Owners of the capital in the sectors experiencing the largest output gains will, in general, experience the largest gains in capital income. Also, the distribution of capital income is quite concentrated. The capital owned by the wealthiest 10% of the Australian population represents approximately 45% of all household net wealth. What that means is high immigration is great for the moneyed up landowner class. It's horrendous for the average Joe Schmo. Roo, buddy. Careful, you're starting to sound like a communist. I thought you loved capitalism. 
Actually, short bus, when people get rich because the government uses its power to manipulate markets, that's not actually capitalism at work. Really? What is it then? Well, that's more like cronyism, or in this case, it's feeding a population and real estate Ponzi. It's also the number one job of the government to protect our borders, and mass immigration is the exact opposite of that. Oh yeah, good point. Hey, have you seen Neggs? She's got all the donuts and she won't share. What do you mean, she won't share? How did she get them? Well, she made them herself. Now she won't give us any unless we pay. What a selfish capitalist pig. It's donut theft. Um, short bus, th that's not... Anyway, it's actually obvious what's going on once you understand the basics of supply and demand. An increase in the supply of workers means lower wages. Throw in a decreased relative supply of full-time jobs and you get the perfect storm for low or no wage growth. As for Sally the Socialist running around with this kind of nonsense... Inequality is at a 70 year high, jobs have been casualised and wage growth is the lowest in a generation. We will continue to fight until we win changes to the rules at work for us and the next generation. Maybe we should ask her what happened the last time we changed the rules at the behest of militant unions. Oh, and then there's this strange little bit of news reported in The Australian. Big Business has joined forces with the ACTU in an unprecedented compact to back a big Australia, calling on the federal government to maintain current levels of permanent migration amid calls for the rate to be cut. The historic coalition of peak unions, employer groups and the ethnic lobby will release a united policy document today warning of the economic and social consequences of dropping the annual migration rate. As the very famous Ranger once asked... Please explain. Yes, yeah, Sally. Care to explain that one for us? I thought you wanted wages to grow. Are you lying or do you just not know how the real world works? That's right, Nix. It's probably both. There she is! Get her! Seize the pig of production! <sighs> Short pass. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching my video all the way to the end. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that kind of thing, and click the bell if you want notifications. Also, if you were to share my video on your social media, that would be absolutely amazing because YouTube's extremely unlikely to recommend the videos of small creators these days. It's just the way their algorithm is at the moment. Hopefully it changes soon. If not, oh well. Also, don't forget to check out the live streams that I do every Monday night on my alternative channel Maddie Rose Live. Used to do them on this channel but now I'm on Maddie Rose Live. Figured it would be better to have a separate channel. Go check it out. You can go to the channel page and it should be in the featured channels section on the top right hand corner of the page. You can go and subscribe there and I'll see you when I see you.